Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of History Savvy. Today, I'm going to be looking at the American Revolution by Oversimplified. And I'm going to be approaching this video a little differently than I have in the past, or really what is generally uh, done in these sort of discussion reaction videos. Rather than just watch the video from beginning to end with pausing and commenting and things like that, I'm going to select just certain parts of the, the video to talk about. The reason for this is uh, the, the last uh, two videos of Oversimplified that I did, Oversimplified slapped a copyright label on it, basically saying your views belong to us. And that's something that I'd like to avoid in future. So uh, that's why I'm going to uh, handle this video the way that I am. I just wanted to let you know that up front. Um, so I didn't give you any false expectations about what you're getting into. And without further ado, let's get into Oversimplified's The American Revolution, Part 1. Holy smokes. Christopher Columbus, that is no way to address the king and queen of Spain. What is wrong with you? Okay, okay, so you know how we're looking for a new trade route to India, right? Right. And the earth is round, right? Right. So I'm thinking we can just sail the other way around the planet, right? Yeah. So I set sail, right? Mm -hmm. And I reach India, right? Right. Wrong. Wrong. I did not reach India. I did not. All right. No. All right. Get to the point. Did so this is depicting the moment that Christopher Columbus appeared before the king and queen of Spain after presumably his first voyage. What I think this is doing is it's compressing um, the experiences of Spain and the relationship between Spain and Christopher Columbus and his voyages to you know what would be called the New World. It, Christopher Columbus did not uh, realize that he had discovered something new for the Europeans. Obviously, there were millions of people living in the Americas in 1492. And <clears throat> he did, uh, however, come to understand that, or at least cognize that this was something that was new um, in world history, that this was not some land that had been described by other voyagers. You know, these were not just islands that were uh, somewhat close to, you know, Asia and India and and those places, but that these were in fact totally separate from them. So this is technically wrong as far as Columbus's meeting with the king and queen after his voyage in 1492, but it's, I think, just trying to compress uh, sort of the zeitgeist. Do you know, there's a whole nother freaking continent out there. Okay, and you think I should care about this? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget to mention there's gold everywhere? Gold? Um, regarding gold and this sort of uh, popular idea that Europeans just understood that there was so much gold in the Americas is a little overplayed here, I think. Columbus uh, did see gold. That the, you know, the people of the Caribbean did have gold, gold jewelry, which that alone, I think, speaks to the um, technological abilities of these people, that they just weren't people in grass skirts eating coconuts and bananas and lounging on the beach every day, that these were people who had a, a sort of structured society. They were an agricultural society, not a, not exactly an agrarian society, but that these were a people with a civilization, so to speak. Um, and Columbus did mention gold in descriptions of the resources of the places he'd been, but it was the gold that Europe really did focus on. Columbus landed in Central America in October 1492. <clears throat> he had the time of his life. And by that I mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree. He stole gold, jewelry, people, and a hammock. And then he returned to show off all of his riches, including a few previously undiscovered items, such as tobacco, the pineapple, turkeys, and a hammock. Now I know what you're thinking, but over simple. Let's jump back to that description for a second here. And kind of unpack how oversimplified is describing this part of of world history and okay so let's let's start columbus is sailing to the americas and america in october 1492 and he had the time of his life and by that i mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree so they're saying columbus just loved it like this was just nothing but you know cupcakes and sunshine for columbus and that he marched all through uh central america and the caribbean unopposed and 
I think by association, other Europeans. That just that's certainly not so. The the history is way more nuanced, and this is I think one of the sort of problems uh, in oversimplifying history. Take for example the Aztecs over here in Mexico. The Aztecs were a highly organized civilization with millions of people. Um, they had they were exacting tributes from these uh, these Mayan people, and it was this uh, sort of negative relationship between the Aztecs and the Mayans that the Europeans exploited in order to conquer the Aztecs. The Europeans just didn't show up and and take things as as they're depicting Columbus here did. I'm sure you know most people would know that and understand that, but you can't lump the experiences of the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the people of the Caribbean together. There were people in these Caribbean islands that totally resisted the any European incursion into their lands. Um, they, you know, would fight them with with bows, arrows, spears, poison darts, you know, things like that. Other people were way more welcoming to the Europeans. <clears throat> So just to simply say that, you know, Columbus just strolled in and took whatever he wanted is is just really wrong. And it's softly bigoted in a way because it just, it uh, argues that Columbus was pretty much all powerful. And the natives were kind of backward, innocent children who could not stop Columbus or the Europeans. And that's that's just not true. Right. Columbus didn't discover America, the Vikings did, and you'd be partially right. In the 11th century, Leif Erikson was the first European to land in America. But hey, if you love Vikings so much, then why don't you check out today's sponsor? <laughs> Horses. Clever way to include a sponsor there. But talking about the uh, arrival of the Vikings and the discovery of America with the Vikings, it, that I think is pretty much archaeologically proven to be true at this point. I might be wrong. Um... But in any event, the Vikings in America is uh, more or less meaningless in talking about the history between Europe and the Americas. I would say one of the reasons why it's insignificant is the the uh, Vikings didn't have any lasting contact with the Americas, and there's no evidence that they transmitted any serious disease between Europe and the Americas, unlike Columbus and later Europeans who transmitted diseases and those diseases ended up killing millions of people here. So it's interesting, but the Vikings in America, I think is more of a historical footnote in looking at the large picture of uh, the relationship between the Americas and Europe. So let's <clears throat> carry on, see what else is interesting here. It's like we have European possessions and conquests. Uh, George Washington's. Let's see. Talk about him. <clears throat> were like, could you not? And the French said, sorry, but no, I could not not. And they went ahead and built their forts, which pissed off the English. So they sent an up and coming British lieutenant colonel by the name of George Washington with a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. After a short battle, the French commander said, all right, all right, we surrender. Okay, boys, pack it up. They're surrendering. Oh, sorry. Was I not meant to split his head open with the tomahawk? Ah. Don't worry, it's not like this will start a seven-year-long major global conflict. And what happened next was a seven-year-long major global conflict, which Great Britain won. So let's scroll back to that map really quick. What happened next was a seven-year-long... So don't think that the incident with Washington, the Native Americans, and the French really was the start of the Seven Years' War. It's, again, way more complicated than that. Um, what you did have was Britain... Uh, and France struggling for control in trade uh, with the Native Americans as well as economic trade between the New World and the Old, old World. Here in Central Europe, you had Prussia, who was uh, competing against uh, political control of Central Europe with uh, Austria. Um, kind of an interesting sort of footnote in the relationship between Prussia and England, who were allies in the Seven Years' War, is the King of England was a prince elector in the Holy Roman Empire because he had land possessions in Hanover where his family came from. Um, so you had England and France uh, kind of battling it out over here, and you had at about the same time you had Prussia invading Austrian lands 
causing conflict over here. So again, it's it's more complicated than what this is is offering. Okay, so we got the Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Stamp Act. So uh, let's 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 look at it. A little it. something like this. Hello, shopkeep. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Bungleberry. Here's the deed for your new shack. Stamp. That'll be three pence, please. Wait, what was that? It's the new tax. I get a stamp on any paper or documentation I make, and you have to pay for it. Would you like to see this pamphlet that explains everything? Yes, please. Okay. Stamp. Two pence. So that's actually a fair description of what was was going on at the time, um, and and taxation. Uh, through documents and stamps and things like that that was that was common in Europe and it was a common way for governments to generate revenue so this was not a unique American experience in fact the other week I was in uh, some Aust uh, upper Austrian archives and uh, some of the documents that I saw I was looking at the 1840s they had stamps on them indicating how much that document was to be taxed so that system of document taxation existed in Europe up through the 19th century. Oh, tar and feathering, okay. That's... British goods were boycotted and anyone loyal to the British found themselves increasingly harassed. The whole thing... So if you want, I think, a good sense of what it was like to tar and feather somebody in the American colonial period, I recommend looking at, um, the, I think it's the first episode of the HBO miniseries, John Adams. Um, where John witnesses the tar and feathering of a uh, tax local tax customs official. And I think it's easy to, to look at this and kind of go, oh, yeah, that, that sucks for the, the guy. But it was really kind of a, it was a violent act. And it was, you know, shameful, embarrassing for the person. And it's just kind of disgusting that people could treat other people that way. So if you want a good sense of what it was like to tar and feather somebody in colonial Boston, go and watch that part from um, the HBO miniseries, John Adams. Though I, I should put a disclaimer on that. Uh, it is true to that act in the sense that it shows, it briefly shows um, a man's private parts. So keep that in mind if you plan on watching that. All right, we got uh, we got George here. What's what's up with King George the Third? And I failed miserably, man. Look at me, I look fabulous. Have you ever seen such a handsome boy? No, sirree, Georgie. No way. You're the handsomest, smartest, most popular king that ever lived, and everybody likes you. You're doing such a good job, but Your Majesty. Oh, this it's this is cute, but I I think it kind of treats um, King George the Third a bit unfairly here. Uh, there was. I think King George really wanted to be more normal and normal in a sense is kind of a commoner. There was a joke in court that said uh, that, that called King George farmer George because he enjoyed just sort of farming on his estates and raising Merino sheep and, and that. So don't get the idea that George the third was this egocentric narcissist. You're still here. Get the hell out. So in 1766, the British made a declaration saying, we can do what we want because we're in charge and you can all go suck it. Then they levied. So let's see. Of course, you know, taxation was a big problem for the American colonists. And I, I, I would say that this probably has something to do with the kind of moral economy between the American colonies and the United Kingdom at this time, where the moral economy in the British... Uh, uh, system of government said that there is representation, especially at this time after the English Civil War, that Parliament represents the people, the common people, at least to a degree. And that wasn't happening here in the colonies. And so people were feeling like they were just second class uh, subjects under the British crown. But it looks like down here we've got. Um, the Boston Massacre. So let's see what they've got to say about that. More British troops turned up in support of their comrade. Snowballs were thrown at the British. The snowballs turned to rocks, the rocks to oyster shells. The soldiers, outnumbered, panicked. One thing leads to another, and you can see where this is going. 
five civilians were killed. The Patriot press throughout the colonies declared the Boston Massacre. So, if I remember correctly, well, first of all, the Boston Massacre was a highly dynamic and even confusing situation. But if I remember correctly, the impetus of the whole situation was there was a um, an apprentice who accused the British soldier standing a sentry of not paying his master for work or something like that. And the disagreement became violent. Uh, the apprentice went and got some more of his buddies to come and harass the soldier. And both sides ended up calling for reinforcements and it became what it became. Um, this picture, however, is uh, really nothing more than a piece of patriotic propaganda. This is not a good description of what happened. One of the reasons for this is we have Captain Preston here standing behind his soldiers, which makes sound military sense. You don't want to be standing in front of your, your soldiers ordering them to fire, otherwise you'll get a musket ball in the back. When in reality, Captain Preston is likely to have been standing in front of his men. And we know that from the uh, court case that resulted from the Boston Massacre here. And part of that court case included depositions. Uh, there was a Richard Palms who in a, was deposed and talked about his experience with Captain Preston, how he was close enough to touch him. They discussed what Captain Preston's uh, sort of course of action that night were was going to be. Um, but also, on the other hand, we've got the colonists who are throwing things at the soldiers, calling them names, uh, saying, damn your bloods, challenging him, even daring them to fire at them. And so in this confusion, you have people saying fire. You can understand how a British soldier would have uh, misunderstood that as coming from Captain Preston. And this sort of conflict between the British power and the colonists, this wasn't the first time it happened. There was another incident of violence in Boston that happened, I think, in 1769, uh, where a boy was killed. Basically what happened was a mob uh, protested and assaulted uh, the, the governor's house. Let's continue. An unwarranted crime committed against the people of Boston by the cruel British, and the anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran aground in Rhode Island was... Okay. This. So we should probably put together a proper army. First, we need to pick a commander-in-chief, and I think we can all agree that that job should go to the man, the myth, the legend, George Washington. My friends, I am humbled and honored that you would consider me for such an important role. I did not expect for this All break. right, you've been showing up in a military uniform every day for the last 10 months. We all know you wanted this, so cut the crap, George. So that is one way to look at how George Washington became commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. But what was going on at the time is um, the New Englanders, John Adams, they believed that it would be in the interest of everybody if everybody put some skin in the game and created a Continental Army uh, where everybody could basically have a say in what went on. At the, before then, this was really a, a New England Army. And like the Southern colonies didn't have as much invested in this as the New England colonies. And everybody expected John Adams to suggest a New Englander to head up this New English army. And they were surprised that he picked George Washington, which ended up being the, very, the right decision. It was a politically smart move at the time, and it proved to be a smart move, as we know from what George Washington was able to accomplish throughout the rest of his life in the United States. So basically, George Washington was a humble man. At this event, he excused himself after John Adams nominated him um, out of modesty to allow these other delegates to discuss his qualifications uh, for being commander-in-chief of the army. In the meantime, a friendly-looking old man by the name of Thomas Paine had written and published a pamphlet called Common Sense. In which so I don't know why they described Thomas Paine as a friendly old man when he was 39 at the time he wrote and published Common Sense. Which he advocated for total independence from Great Britain. It spread across the colonies like wildfire and to this day remains the best-selling title in America. It was read aloud in taverns and meeting halls and brought the idea of independence into the mainstream. 
So that was true. Thomas Paine certainly did help ignite colonist uh, anger towards Britain and help push people towards independence from Britain. ...began to seriously consider the idea. Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official declaration of independence, and he went hard, writing that all men are created equal, with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's all true. Um, he was also part of a four-man committee. The other two men were John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, and I can't remember the name of the other man. But Thomas Jefferson wasn't alone in drafting the Declaration of Independence. Of course, Jefferson had over 100 slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On this, I, You know, it's always, it's never a, a bad thing to talk about slavery in America. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson did basically blame the King of England for, he, I think he said, the sin of slavery in America, even though he himself was a slaveholder. Um, but because that was a politically fraught topic, that was removed from the Declaration of Independence so that Southern colonies would basically sign on. So uh, the discussion of slavery in America was, was kicked down the road, as, as we know. The 2nd of July, Congress voted unanimously in favor of independence, and John Adams declared that the 2nd of July would go down as the most remembered day in American history. Then a couple days later, independence actually came into effect. The United States... So yes, the 2nd of July, the Continental Congress first voted for independence. That was the significant day for independence. On July 4th, it was basically finalized and formalized. So it looks like... Got... Well, what have we got here? The Americans kept holding out for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decoy. The main British force was going around... Oh, okay, to so just sort of the, the military actions of both armies. And looks like we get to part two. So I guess looking at the video as a whole, uh, there's... Definitely some good to it. I think this video as a whole helps a person become um, conversant in the history of the American Revolution, but it's a double-edged sword. By oversimplifying history, you in a way rewrite history, and you can rewrite it in a bad way, and you can make it wrong history in, a, in essence. And I think in some cases in this video, oversimplified really kind of flirts with that sort of line with with bad history just for the sake of making it oversimplified and that's their shtick i know but in the end bad history is bad history and what good is bad history to anybody but i recommend this video to people who are interested in the subject you can learn things from this video it's not a, a bad video and uh i'd like to thank you for watching i will leave the description or the the link to this full video in the description below and we will catch you in part two